uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. Uh, today we will hear from Michaela Novak, uh, who is a student, uh, a doctoral candidate actually in sociology at Australian National uh, University. She also has a PhD in, uh, in economics. Um, she uh, has a wide range of uh, intellectual interests, has uh, published on a wide range of topics, but what you probably already know about the most, or you can associate the most with her name, is the book Inequality and uh, Entangled Political uh, Perspective. Um, and uh, it's an excellent, excellent uh, book. It was published in 2018. I can't recommend it highly enough because it really does offer a um, unique perspective on inequality. So what we think of or most economists or even social thinkers in general with inequality is income, right? That's how we uh, define it, how we measure it. It's all income based. Uh, and there is debate on how to do it right and whether we are doing this right with uh, uh, by looking at income alone. But what Michaela does is kind of um, leaves that uh, debate behind and offers a different perspective, right? She looks at the inequality in terms of relations and and it's uh, basically a treatment of inequality as a as a problem of complexity. So if you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it. And there is a great a symposium in uh, cosmos and taxes on on the on the book that sort of offers um, uh, a couple of different uh, perspectives from different authors. Michaela is currently working on a on a new book uh, on social movements, a classical liberal perspective uh, on social movements. And if that's not enough in terms of her diversity of interests, she has also written on Bitcoin, and she is uh, doing some work on utopias, right? So uh, quite a quite a range of topics. And um, I got to know her because she's been uh, the, uh, quite involved in, in setting up the website and helping out lifting this, uh, this, this uh, effort of the, of the Entangled Political Economy uh, Network for which I'm very, very grateful. Okay, with that, uh, Michaela, the, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marta. Um, it's a very great pleasure for me to uh, be able to present to you today. Uh, as always, I am grateful to work alongside Marta Podenska Miklos in organising uh, this entangled political economy research <laughs> network. The purpose of my presentation is to give you an overview of recent research of mine, uh, which is intended to be submitted to a special issue of the Cosmos and Taxis Journal. In this research, I outline some broad uh, principled considerations concerning the interpretability of the COVID-19 pandemic from an entangled political economy perspective. And as we're very highly aware, uh, whether we be in the United States, Australia, Europe, uh, this is a, a very, very important uh, topic of uh, of, of great import. As you would be aware, uh, COVID-19 is an infectious disease spread through droplets of mucus and saliva from persons who are infected. The most common COVID symptoms such as headaches and a scratchy throat and so on and so forth appear to be experienced mildly in most individual cases. In more severe cases of infection, uh, symptoms may include pneumonia and respiratory failure, compromised function or failure of other vital organs such as kidneys or the liver, blood clots and strokes, septic shocks, and ultimately uh, death. The lion's share of media and popular commentary concerning this novel coronavirus is centered upon incidents and fatalities using aggregative statistics for nation states uh, or subnational regions. The diagrams on your screen, which are admittedly a little compressed, my apologies for that, uh, from left to right nonetheless, illustrate uh, from the left-hand side, the much cited John Hopkins University online COVID dashboard um, and national level statistical ag aggregates for selected major countries in respect of aggregate cases in the middle diagram and for the right, far right hand side diagram, uh, COVID-19 case fatality rates. Either, these are the most common statistics uh, that are presented in respect of uh, this matter. 
the distribution and intensity of this coronavirus has uh, certainly assumed pandemic proportions. Uh, late last week, uh, there were over 52 million cases globally, which is an extremely high number, and close to 1.3 million fatalities attributed to this virus. Uh, as Professor Richard Wagner has shown, with great care and insight in respect of macroeconomic phenomena, it, it is important to be aware that the statistical artifices presented here are not, are not independent entities. In as much as the publicity of such aggregations are said to entail great influence, especially over policymakers and other key decision makers, coronavirus statistics are intended to more but probably less efficaciously given reporting difficulties reflect the distribution and severity of disease among thinking, feeling, purposeful agents at micro and meso levels of action and engagement. The focus upon tracking aggregate coronavirus statistics aside, it does seem terribly important to consider the ways in which coronavirus has influenced the everyday business of life facing individuals. Uh, I present on this slide, as you can see, three images. So on the far left-hand side, I refer to a news story from Cairns, Australia, uh, and the closure of a three-decade-long small business specialising in the retail sale of opals and other gemstones. The economic viability of this store, among so many in northern Australia, has been decimated by the almost complete halt in foot traffic attributable to COVID-19 border closures and the prohibition of international travel. The middle image that you see is of a man despondently sitting in front of a retail store in Bangalore, uh, India, during a localised lockdown order period. In a story reported on the CB, uh, CNBC website, references made to a so-called economic bloodbath on the streets of India's Silicon Valley. A local store owner, a man named Mir Riaz, rudely discovers he cannot pay commercial rent on his store. He is quoted as saying, I am suffering like many others. Whatever is my fate, I have to face it. The right hand image is of a posted sign on a business entry shop front in Melbourne, Australia, which until recently experienced the world's most punitive governmental lockdown measures. Uh, and I might actually uh, mention in passing, there was a very interesting uh, article just posted on uh, the Reason uh, website, Elizabeth Nolan Brown and a colleague uh, referred to personal experiences uh, in, in relation to COVID-19, which I'd also highly recommend. Uh, so these three examples and the fourth one that I've just improvisationally added now um, are just four of so many during 2020. And they allude to quashed, quashed aspirations and shattered dreams that come with the severe curtailment of livelihood freedom. The eudaimonic pursuit of individual betterment at the micro level is surely not divorced from broader institutional and policy considerations as, as I shall explain later. Furthermore, the micro level testimonies of economic heartache and pain may also be understood through sociological or socio-psychological lenses, but this suggestion seems better left for another place and time. With due consideration to micro and macro phenomena, entangled political economy I believe uh, offers potentially unique insight to consider the effects of economic and political developments at the meso level. Um, allow me briefly for those uninitiated to explain what entangled political economy, EPE for short, theoretically entails. It is a framework to advance the understanding of social coordination and to restore economics as a true study of society. It views individuals and the private and public sectors as being intertwined in overlapping exchange relationships along competitive 
and collaborative dimensions. EPE draws upon a long tradition of mainline Smithian Mengarian political economy and is also inspired by modern complexity, evolutionary and network theories. So let us consider a mock economy uh, here is an ensemble of connections between hexagonal com uh, commercial enterprises and triangular political enterprises. In this very highly simplified case, prior to the, uh, uh, consider the topology of an entangled political economy prior to COVID to be represented by the diagram on the left hand side. So, Widespread diffusion of coronavirus is depicted by the right-hand side diagram with the virus floating around everywhere, uh, induces a range of responses that reflect ultimately human choices. COVID has led to disentanglements of certain economic relationships, particularly those whose production or provision modalities entail high levels of physical personal interaction. The cessation of the connection between two commercial enterprises, indicated by case A, if you look at the diagram, you know, there's a elimination of a connection, uh, is one example of disentanglement. Another example of disentanglement is illustrated by the disappearance of a nodal commercial enterprise shown by case B. So if you look at the, uh, the bottom uh, left-hand corner on the, of the picture on the right-hand side, you see that a hexagonal commercial enterprise has disappeared from the economic scene altogether. The disentanglements illustrated here may occur as a result of policies such as lockdown orders or may result from large numbers of consumers endogenously choosing to refrain from high levels of human contact. It is also conceivable under the EPE framework that biophysical events such as viral spread can lead to relational re-entanglements. So consider case C in these diagrams. Case C represents an episode of COVID period re-entanglement between a commercial and political enterprise, owing, for example, to a new subsidization arrangement. In case D, toward the bottom of the right-hand side diagram, we actually see another case of re-entanglement. On this occasion, from one political enterprise to another. Such an event may transpire, say, when an economic development agency and a health agency, perhaps even a hospital, establish a relationship. The two enterprises may establish, for example, a policy to produce more masks or surgical gowns as an autarkic leaning economic self-sufficiency measure. An examination of degree distribution over time in the simplified case provided would reveal a relative concentration of activity favoring political enterprises. This is attributable to the loss of the commercial connections plus the so-called gain of a subsidy connection as in case C. Now, the stylized cases I nominate here do not include the practical on the ground realities of participants within and among commercial enterprises applying their entrepreneurial talent and improvisational skills to reconfigure production processes, which would imply in itself some kind of re-entanglement with others within the political economy scene. In the time remaining, I wish to turn to three interrelated considerations regarding the application of EPE theory to COVID. Respectively, these are A, the matter of so-called economic freezing or hibernation, B, the peculiar business of healthcare, and C, 
fiscal and monetary policy expansionism. Now, the import of the previous slide, albeit relying upon a grossly simplified representation of an entangled political economy, is that the economy is forever in a state of flux. This insight sits most uneasily, I believe, with political rhetoric to the effect that the economy, indeed a society, may somehow be frozen or hibernated until coronavirus somehow exhausts itself into extinction, which then and only then can seamlessly bring forth an economic thawing or awakening. There are no clear distinctions made between the, these concepts, these improvisational concepts of freezing or hibernating, with one's best estimation being the former, that is freezing, being perhaps more comprehensive and more severe in its application. Um, hibernation, according to some who have propounded uh, the idea, seemingly implies a short-term deactivation of so-called non-essential activities, bearing intensive levels of physical interaction. As an aside, that does bear the question as to what is essential and what is non-essential in, in an economic sense. Uh, though as a speculative matter, perhaps this language uh, that we see uh, per pervading in, econ in, in political discourse uh, is perhaps intended to present a kinder, softer face to what is the harsh reality of economic disruption, if not destruction of certain forms of capital, jobs and trade. Economic understanding, however, possesses the habit of bursting rhetorical positioning. Specifically, entangled political economy bursts the rhetorical spin of an economic freezing or hibernating, which in fact violates notions of economic and social evolution. The pandemic has clearly rendered a reshaping of relationships. There is never any freezing or hibernation because economic passioning and repassioning is always in motion. There is always activity and thus pandemic policy rhetoric born of comparative static equilibrating sensibilities are unlikely to amply recognize the profound implications of restrictions grounded in an objective of sanctioning human interactivity and relationship building. The pandemic has not only laid labor capital and other resources idle through sways of our entangled political economies. There have been some micro and meso level accounts of individual entrepreneurs reconfiguring commercial practices in the service of social needs to promote public health among other objectives. Uh, clothing and textiles manufacturers have reconfigured their operations to produce masks and certain beverage processes have converted from producing alcohol to producing hand sanitizer. Shifts in policy positions, including the availability of new subsidies and transfer schemes, have themselves created incentives for perverse entrepreneurship in the form of rent-seeking competition and redistribution along those lines. The, the, the point is, is that entangled political economies have not remained static in light of COVID-19. One may sort of draw upon the Nozickian point that liberty upsets patterns, but surely uh, severe stringent policy also in this case uh, upsets patterns. From an EPE perspective, an economy cannot be realistically perceived as being amenable to toggling between states of activation, deactivation and reactivation. Indeed, it is a conceited political position in my view to believe that regulatory or other policies can revive the order of a complex evolutionary and entangled economy precisely as it once was prior to the COVID-19 contagion. Whereas the effect of pandemic policies is to re-entangle some relationships and to disentangle others entirely, many of these measures are highly likely to induce persistent realignments which cannot be easily reversed. 
An understudied research topic is the relationship between entanglement and agility, a matter I attribute to a 2019 Facebook discussion by our friend Abigail Devereaux. Uh, agility is, to be sure, a nuanced concept, but I believe it generally conveys the ability of agents to respond swiftly to change in preferably efficient and effective directions. Now, there seems little doubt that legislators and bureaucrats, especially in middle to high income countries, have displayed a certain sense of agility in response to COVID-19. A study by Oxford researchers showed that several OECD countries activated highly stringent policies within roughly 50 days of their first confirmed coronavirus fatality. The economic, social and epidemiological efficacies of stringent pandemic responses and the warrantability of policy action bias in managing novel coronavirus, however, will be surely debated for years, if not decades to come. It is also quite apparent that policy-induced disentanglements and re-entanglements will affect to some extent the agility of economic actors to establish their own vibrant and robust post-pandemic networks. One concern has been that stringent regulatory policies and the so-called yo-yo effect of alternating periods of lockdown and reopening as cases and or fatalities fluctuate in regions such as Europe introduces significant instability for agents in the short term, as well as significant uncertainties for the broader economic outlook. Periods of crisis, which heavily implicate political involvement, inject new sources of turbulence, compromising the abilities of individuals and firms to confidently engage in economic calculation, entrepreneurship, and innovation, as well as establishing those relationships necessary for future growth and development. The question is, how can someone trust the integrity of contracts or have confidence that property control and usage will confer a reasonable rate of return when governments can enact policies obligating the private sector to massively disentangle or re-entangle in ways that confer reduced economic value in an instant. This phenomenon is referred to in the political economy literature as regime uncertainty and has been identified as a serious impediment to economic development. Now, it is difficult to establish the degree of regime un uh, uncertainty resulting from COVID-19 policy responses thus far. Uh, a recent study of expectations among American small business that I quite quote in my working paper suggested that business closure risks were associated with the expected length of the COVID-19 crisis, which is at this point of time, a little bit of an imponderable. Uh, then again, of course, and consistent with what I've just said, uh, there were wild, wildly varying beliefs about the likely duration of pandemic related disruption. This and other studies provide indirect and selective representations of uncertainty, but they perhaps supportively hint at my thesis that the agility of certain economic enterprises to forge productive, mutually beneficial arrangements have been severely compromised this year. And this is particularly the case for both trade exposed and highly physically interactional uh, industries. Numerous OECD member countries have introduced subsidy bailouts for certain industries and even whole of economy wage subsidies for full-time employees. Some concerns have been raised that this politico-operational creep of subsidization together with the radical easing of fiscal monetary policies and regulatory changes such as uh, very much relaxed bankruptcy provisions might promote the creation of so-called zombie firms whose existence will be dependent upon continuation 
of public sector subsidies and, and other particularised privileges, uh, perhaps even as the worst of the pandemic has eased. These concerns tie in very closely with EPE studies referring to the potential for monstrous moral hybrid entities to become foreground models of economic organisation. Operalization of such hybrids reflects a commingling of private and public ordering precepts, uh, distorting entrepreneurial prioritizations to competitively discover profitable means of engagement. Associated with this particular concern is that post-COVID proposals to reverse pandemic era subsidy, tax, and regulatory privileges might elicit intense contestation and tectonic rupturing between rivalrous economic, political, and social interests. Much academic and popular commentary surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic has suggested that the virus will exacerbate or solidify certain pre-COVID economic, political, and social trends. Such observations are apt with respect to the healthcare sector, in my view, and um, which was identified by Arnold Kling and Nick Schulz in 2011 as embodying part of a new commanding heights within increasingly services-oriented modern economies. It is patently obvious that the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the relative luminosity of health entanglements relative to others on the same societal plane of interactivity. There are numerous anecdotal examples of new and strengthened healthcare entanglements in response to the coronavirus, and I'll run through a few of those. Uh, for example, governments have called on existing healthcare workers to repurpose their tasks towards the care of those suffering symptoms as well as seeking retired medical professionals to return to the workforce. Health political enterprises are engaged in procurements of additional personal protective equipment for nurses, physicians, and other medical staff, as well as equipment for patients suffering severe respiratory problems. Public sector entities seek to build additional healthcare infrastructure. The relative expansion in the importance of public sector big players has been accompanied by a COVID-19 vaccine race by major pharmaceutical companies, as well as prestigious biochemistry and medical academic institutes. These developments are a reflection of the general idea that this pandemic has actually given rise to new kinds of entrepreneurship, as well as altering the sorts of problems people believe that they have, and finally, generating new profit opportunities in a Kersenarian sense, whilst suppressing others. Now, a national accounting perspective of these developments I describe would produce a, would produce a statistical indication of growth in public sector expenditure as a share of GDP. An EPE perspective would emphasize, though, that government spending is not functionally homogeneous. Spending is conducted by an array of diverse political enterprises authorized by an underlying legislative authority, but practically allowing for some measure of discretion exercised by ministerial members of the political executive. The spending is typically given legal and operational form by contractual agree agreements and procurement obligations, giving rise to entanglements with beneficiaries situated elsewhere within the economy. The expenditure is financed either through tax attachments by political entities onto viable commercial entities, or more likely, given the severe downturn of regular economic activity and recurrent revenue, through some other financing vehicle. Uh, such as borrowing. The COVID-19 pandemic has in effect solicited a wave of new entanglements in the form of contracts between governmental authorities 
private sector concerns and other entities. These contracts, uh, as alluded to uh, a few moments ago, per pertain to the acquisition of medical devices and equipment, diagnostic goods and pharmaceuticals, as well as agreements engaged in construction work to expand hospital and other facilities. The presentation of funding and service provision opportunities might well be considered uh, to open rent-seeking opportunities for healthcare organisations, interest groups, and other stakeholders. The dominating position of healthcare in modern economies appear to become even more entrenched as the coronavirus becomes a focal point of economic, social, and broader public attention. A clear manifestation of centripetal momentum concerning political activity has been the substantial and sudden elevation of public health authorities in the determination of COVID-19 policy responses. One of the features of contemporary pandemic biopolitics has been the elevation of figurehead public health officials, such as Anthony Fauci in the United States, and forgive me if I mispronounce, uh, Tedros uh, Ghebreyesus of the World Health Organization in public and political discourse. In some instances, such as the case of Dr. Fauci, public health officials have peculiarly enjoyed quasi-celebrity status. I characterize the raised profile of public health officials an example of, as an example of tightening entanglement within the healthcare space between health policymakers and their scientific technical advisors, but which also invokes a sense of blurriness in the relationship between the two sets of actors. Public health officials have presented a discursive platform to propagate independent, but perhaps alternative sources of medical advice. A presumption here is that perceptions of trust in advice from supposedly independent sources, as opposed to legislators themselves, would incentivize populations to adopt public health practices and routines. However, there is a great potential, I think, for contradictory sets of advisories uh, released by legislator, legislator and bureaucratic advisor. Now, uh, putting aside questions of epidemiological accuracy and truthfulness in claims making, the suggestion I make here is that the prospect of contradictory sources of advice could aggravate uncertainty during a pandemic period. Uh, this in turn may generate confusion as well as potentials for misinformation and conspiratorial thinking in respect to coronavirus incidents, its medical severity, and the reasonableness of proposed policies to address COVID-19. Important recent contributions to the epistemology of expertise by Roger Koppel, followed up by recent working papers by Dick Wagner and Marta, are also relevant here. Scientific understandings of coronavirus properties and human impacts continue to remain a source of distributed intellectual discovery of, and contestation of conjectures and refutations as famously described by Karl Popper. Human beings are capable, but they also demonstrate fallibility. Even prominent individuals such as Fauci or uh, Donald Trump, who had shown a proclivity, proclivity for disagreement with Fauci. There is the risk that widespread community trust in erroneous advice propagated by an official imbued with a certain public political authority could also lead to catastrophic effects, such as in the clumsily handled debates over masking efficacy. One final matter before moving on. Difficulties in discussing health matters are compounded by an appreciation that most healthcare output possesses credence good characteristics wherein the user experiences great difficulty in verifying claims about the performance of products, treatments, or services. Assessing the efficacy and, and efficiency of health interventions and treatments is difficult at the best of times. The difficulty of ex post inspection and verification of COVID-19 policy measures appears compounded 
by the epistemic ambiguity surrounding scientific understandings of what is a novel coronavirus. It may be argued that the pandemic has surely increased the demand for credence goods such as public health and that this shift benefits those entrepreneurs who find support in the realm of increasingly monocentric and politically influenced healthcare activities. Such developments are far from riskless in that the potential for policy error is magnified. In addition, the partiality of political prerogatives in the pandemic context has serious consequences for the effectiveness and value of non-governmental initiatives in health financing, innovation, and provision. Whilst word limitations prevented me from discussing the important fiscal and monetary policy dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic in my working paper, I would actually like to take the brief opportunity now to consider a few implications. There is little question that most governments around the world have aggressively spent and borrowed and engaged in quixotic monetary policy measures as the coronavirus has taken hold. As indicated earlier, political enterprises have been legislatively authorized to provide an extensive array of subsidy programs. Many of these recurrent non-capital programs have been financed by borrowings on the part of political enterprises, including central treasury agencies. There is a wealth of political economy literature stretching from James Buchanan through to Dick Wagner and Giuseppe Giuseppe today, warning of the detrimental consequences of such borrowing activity upon the development of future productive capital stock. Our contemporary monetary economists such as Alex Salter and his colleagues at the American Institute for Economic Research, as well as Pete uh, Bocker and others, have drawn critical attention to the bevy of peculiar monetary policy measures assumed by the Federal Reserve and other central banks in recent months. These measures include ultra low official cash rate settings, quantitative easing initiatives of government bond purchases, and more recently reinterpretations of the significance of employment in central bank policy mandates. The political rationalization of contemporary monetary policy has been at least since the 2007 08 global financial crisis to so-called supercharge business investment activities. The macro statistical record on this front, however, has been quite truly uninspiring. To a non-trivial extent, the impact of the current era of unfolding crises, together with policy regime uncertainties upon economic confidence, perhaps provide some explanation for the dispiriting economic results that we see. The political exhortations to the effect that lax monetary policy together with enlargement of the public debt stock is intended to support investments by commercial enterprises deflects attention away from the intergenerational consequences of debt financed recurrent public expenditure, as well as the conveniences afforded uh, by central banks with respect to the debt servicing costs carried by political enterprises. Uh, recent books by Pierre Lemieux and Richard Solzman and recent articles by Alex Salter remind us of the significance of fiscal and monetary policy interactions, which have become even more tightly bound together during this COVID-19 pandemic. In raising the potential dilemmas and actual dilemmas and problems arising from governmental responses to COVID-19, I do not actually wish to embrace a contrarian or fringe view uh, as to the, uh, the, the idea that public policies are somehow unwarranted to deal with public health problems. Uh, my own position is similar to that of Nick Cohen, Sam Bowman and others, uh, to the extent that uh, their position is that liberalism maintains a commitment to the preservation of life in addition to liberty and property. Furthermore, luminaries of modern liberal thought, such as Friedman, for example, in his Capitalism and Freedom, 
and Hayek, for example, in the Constitutional Liberty, argued that a policy response to address the negative externalities of a contagious disease and to treat those suffering illness uh, is warranted. Nevertheless, the nomination of public health as a warrantable area for politically induced entanglement should be accompanied, as suggested recently by Mark Pennington, by proper, and I quote, proper appreciation of the levels of complexity in play and whether there are effective feedback mechanisms available to policymakers to cope with the uncertainties at hand. A legitimate concern raised as far as I can establish by many liberals is not only that lockdown and other measures on the more stringent side of the policy spectrum um, not only generate costs in terms of economic hardship and the containment of civic liberty, a spatially comprehensive and economically all-encompassing application of one key policy measure such as locking down or up entire urban populations, potentially reduces the scale and scope wherein localized non-state measures can take place. This in turn potentially compromises the capacity of actors within entangled political economies to generate and receive feedback about what works to address viral spread and what does not. There would be little doubt that many around the world were heartened by recent news that Pfizer and Moderna vaccine trials have so far rated highly in terms of medical efficacy. The Pfizer trial, I understand, uh, did not receive funding under President Trump's Operation Warp Speed, uh, but this major commercial enterprise once again demonstrated the capacity of business to proactively respond to economic, social, and indeed political problems. The present vaccine race seems a salutary lesson of the broader notion that the thoroughbred, uh, so-called, of Schumpeterian innovation should be allowed to un outrun the donkey of governmental influence and policy control. Finally, I think there is a profundity animating Dick Wagner's invocation of a constitutional liberty. This framework illustrates that the minimization of arbitrary and unstructured patterns of public authority empower creative enterprising individuals to develop and keep, as long as circumstances allow, mutually beneficial entanglements which drive growth and productivity. During a crisis period, the principle of structured political authority and impartial government is at greatest risk of being overturned. Policy space has arguably been overcrowded lately with too many peculiar fiscal, monetary, and regulatory experiments in an extremely short span of time to respond to a virus unseen by the naked eye and whose transmission properties and biological effects are still yet to be fully understood. Now, it is legitimate to deal with a public health problem, but I believe it is also incumbent upon liberals to maintain rather cool, sensible heads with respect to the capabilities and limitations of policy responses. Allow me to summarize, please, my key arguments. EPE offers a distinctive, yet I consider a fruitful approach to understanding economic, political implications of pandemics. The realities of complex networked economies subject to evolution challenge political or any other narratives to the effect that dynamic, and processual productive activities may somehow be frozen or hibernated at will. Entangled political economy attunes us to think of policy impacts upon patterns of economic interaction and relationships and how crisis rhetoric reshapes considerations of appropriateness regarding the boundaries of commercial and political activities. In certain regards, the COVID-19 pandemic represents a range of accelerationist impulses concerning fiscal and monetary policy discretion in the short term and of healthcare financing and provision in the longer term. Finally, I see EPE raises awareness as to how distributed human insight, intelligence and knowledge may be harnessed to respond to COVID-19 
without irreparably damaging liberal institutions, procedures and standards, catalyzing and supporting entangled networks of voluntaristic interaction. EPE reaffirms the reason of rules pertaining to such matters as contractual freedom, preservation of property rights, and the freedom of economic entry and exit. It also encourages us to consider that decentralized, polycentric, polycentrically situated entrepreneurs and other economic actors be afforded the dignity and respect to self-select their own operations, managing resource trans transformations and entanglements to fructify such operations. These capacities seem just as important during a pandemic crisis period as in times of relative placidity and tranquility. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. Um, so let's open up to, uh, to questions. Uh, I, I think I have everyone. Well, if you wanna just say in the, in the chat, just put your name or just raise your hand. We can, we have a smaller group today. Um, so we can just, you know, I, I can, I think I can see everyone. So uh, <laughs> just raise your hand or put your name in the chat and that's how we, what we will do for, uh, for questions. So yeah, who wants to, um, who wants to get us started? Okay, Cameron. Yeah. And unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Hi. Right, so uh, great presentation, a lot to think about. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, it seems like it's oriented very much toward a critique of policy. And one argument that I've heard that makes some sense to me is that the marginal effect of policy actually wasn't that great. That a lot of the lockdown and shutdown is because people aren't going to go out and they voluntarily refrain from going out, which I think is going to have a lot of the same kinds of effects you're talking about, even without any kind of political intervention. And so I wonder um, how much does your analysis change or how much do the normative conclusions change if this is kind of a spontaneous reaction rather than a policy imposition? Um, thank you, Cameron. That, that is a, a terrific question. I, I certainly think at the most immediate level, uh, the conclusion of my assessment will change to the extent that um, the relative weight of uh, responses shift uh, from uh, the political domain to uh, sort of the, the non-state domain. And I entirely agree with you. And I do mention uh, this in the working paper. In fact, uh, the, the sort of the impact of, um, you, know, you can almost, you call them spontaneously ordered or uh, sort of voluntaristic and, and as well as mutually beneficial uh, sort of responses uh, to uh, the pandemic insofar as uh, physical distancing sort of reduces uh, the spread of coronavirus. Uh, a, a very interesting phenomena. I, I don't know whether it actually started in Australia or not, but, uh, but it seemed to be a sort of practice spread around the world as a, um, a, a hoarding of toilet paper essentially. So, uh, and this is one curious and interesting uh, sort of um, uh, ex-ante response, actually. I would actually regard this as a sort of a leading indicator of uh, expectations by uh, individuals at the sort of decentra decentralized polycentric level that uh, some lockdown uh, sort of regulatory measures are about to happen. So better get on rushing to the store to hoard uh, your toilet paper plus your flour, your, your pasta and so on, um, in part because you'll be doing a lot more interactivity uh, in the home in, in sort of one, one space. Uh, I also, so that, that is uh, sort of one uh, way in which uh, sort of people have uh, improvisationally sort of responded. And I think certainly as people have learned uh, over time that there's a prospect of yo-yoing lockdowns and then freeing and then lockdowns and freeing that uh, people have acted in this way in a sort of a, uh, as a leading indicator. So there is actually sort of a, a rational choice, a theoretic explanation waiting to be told in terms of that. Um, but uh, as, as indicated in um, the, the working paper and briefly 
in the talk as well. Um, you know, a number of businesses have been able to reconfigure uh, their capital uh, in such ways to pr help produce uh, additional uh, supplies because, you know, curiously enough, um, uh, largely politically dominated health enterprises were found uh, quite exposed and with regards to shortages, uh, even sort of governmental critical national stockpiles of uh, certain equipment uh, uh, being found to be uh, sort of uh, in short uh, supply. So, um, you know, there are many ways in which uh, sort of people on the ground and, and, and then, then, then there, there's also in addition to that, um, you know, the, the responses by people of certain demographics, you know, sort of people of a, a certain vintage, we may speak, uh, you know, have made their own endogenous choices in response to uh, the, the possibility of a viral spread uh, detrimentally impacting on their health. So um, in as much as I, um, um, my, my talk and my working paper is dominated by, you know, political considerations, one can't ignore those. Uh, the, there has been, to be sure, a, a quite lively responses along many several margins, um, you know, by people in their sort of private capacities and by commercial enterprises, no question about that. Um, I, you know, I, I think, I think um, you know, as I indicated, um, the only way in which that would sort of reshape, uh, you know, my paper is just to basically uh, emphasize a tilt toward, you know, the more spontaneously ordered uh, sort of aspects of uh, responses to the, the pandemic. All right, thank you. Pleasure. Okay, uh, Jamie and then Roger. Go ahead. Thank you so much. There's so, uh, so many interesting things I could comment here, but I'll just ask one question for now, um, which is that you brought up this issue of the fact that uh, top-down policy solutions can dull the potential for bottom-up problem solving uh, mm. that is more in tune to the unique needs of the community. And my question is, once the federal apparatus has both the capacity and the demonstrated willingness to take a particular type of action. How do you ever put the toothpaste back in the tube in terms of people then not expecting um, a, a response to come forward? Um, uh, so uh, I'll just yeah, leave uh, it no, there. that's good. Yeah, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you there, Jamie. Right at the uh, the the end. I, I think, uh, and I think. Uh, uh, your sort of question, this is certainly the latter part of it, uh, brings me back to that curious uh, toilet paper and private good hoarding uh, example. So, uh, you know, when people become, uh, when, when, you know, there's a learning environment involved in, in this, uh, even in, re in a sort of uh, economically repressive environment such as this, there is still capacity for social learnings to take place. So once people become aware that um, uh, the, the toothpaste uh, has been uh, emptied out of its tube and therefore uh, it, it, it's become very well aware uh, that governments uh, have assumed within their repertoire of policy responses uh, measures of quite stringent citywide or even uh, regionally wide sort of lockdown, you know, people still look for cues uh, in uh, their sort of social milieu, uh, even through media, especially through media, in fact, uh, to sort of see, to test or to see or, or to anticipate um, whether uh, governments will uh, sort, of, uh, sort of adjust their sort of policy positions towards more stringent policies or relaxation. In the case of anticipated uh, stringency and uh, restrictiveness, uh, people will tend to go out to, to hoard. I, you know, as I've said before, I think there is a, an element of sort of rational choice behavior. It's completely understandable um, from that perspective. Um, I, I do, I mean, I do have a, a, a concern. It's not, uh, what I'm about to say is not necessarily very well thought out and it's something I probably would like to sort of think uh, a little more um, as, as sort of time uh, comes ahead. Um, but there does seem to be a certain sort of um, uh, policy transmission uh, process or a, a policy practice transmission that had taken place 
Uh, and, it, and it has been somewhat concerning to me that uh, liberal democratic societies, which you would presume uh, would uh, provide the greatest uh, allowance, if not scope, uh, for polycentric, polycentrically sort of uh, oriented practices to go about, uh, seem to sort of reflexively adopt a, um, a sort of a policy position of stringent lockdown, which was uh, seen most visibly uh, in East Asia uh, during late 2019 and very early 2020. So in that sense, it seemed to me that the sort of practices seen in uh, Wuhan and uh, elsewhere, you know, sort of strict locking down, we even saw some of the, you know, more, um, you know, more troubling images of, you know, whole apartments being soldered, you know, people using soldering iron to uh, sort of lock down entire apartments. That then seemed to be quite instinctively the uh, the response that governments adopted, I know even in, you know, my home country, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of public discourse was oriented around, you know, even uh, in social media hashtag lockdown now, referring to those very stringent measures uh, as a sort of perverted form of uh, learning about sort of policy, uh, sort of around regulatory practice. Um, very difficult to put the toothpaste in because now there is a collective memorialization of what can potentially occur. Um, yes, yeah, so um, so I think one of the so the second last slide I had was you know in, um, in in brackets what probably should have been done. So in liberal democratic societies, probably should have thought more uh, intelligently uh, to think about uh, polycentric practices. Polycentric practices on a vast um, uh, array levels, it seems to me, can be effective, for example, if populations voluntarily uh, wear a mask. That, that, that seems to be particularly effective. Um, I trust that's not too much of a long-winded response to your, to your great question. Thanks. Uh, all right. And uh, I think, Roger, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, I'm you, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. and, and my apologies if, if my question is a little out of place. Uh, I, I had a little distraction here for a minute, right when Jamie was speaking. I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. Um, I, I want to get back to Cameron's question. I, I kind of took Cameron to be asking, um, like, you know, if, if we have a lockdown and it's like government does a lockdown and it's bad, you know, but then if we have just people responding spontaneously, voluntarily, and they're staying inside and not having large gatherings and stuff, uh, on, voluntarily on their own without a mandate, uh, you have the the um, two very different mechanisms to achieve the same result. So, can lockdown really be all that bad? If anyway, people would be doing the same kind of thing, you know, exercising the same kind of precaution anyway. I, I took that to be kind of Cameron's challenge. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm getting a nod from him. So, um, and, and I just, my hunch is the answer is very much no, because um, of the fine grain, the granular level of decision making possible in the one case, not possible in the other. I think we might even have an example here in New York State with the um, uh, nursing home admissions, right? That nursing homes were required to admit COVID patients, okay, which then just spread the COVID deaths more widely among the very aged than would otherwise have happened. That was terrible. I mean, it's just like a shock. So that's um, a, just one rather coarse illustration of uh, the difference between a result that's imposed and a result that emerges organically. Forgive me for blabbering on, just one extra moment. Uh, it's, it, Alex Salter, same thing with like the, end, you know, uh, net GDP growth criterion, right? Uh, it's one thing if it emerges from a, from a decentralized banking system, it's another thing if a central bank tries to impose it. Those are actually different things that produce different outcomes. So am I getting the gist of where you're going with that, Cameron? Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think there's legitimacy to, to what you say. Um, there, there are, there seems to me, uh, but I need to think through this more clearly, and I'm, I'm very much, again, thankful for Cameron's original question, because it's a terrific one, um, to think about the extent to which there is a, a logical sort of equivalence between 
a, a top-down gov governmentally imposed uh, lockdown using regulatory me measures versus a voluntaristically sort of emergently ordered um, uh, a set of practices of physical distancing that people just voluntarily assume. Uh, in the former, uh, you have the operalization of police power, um, which uh, in some parts of the world, and I'll refer yeah. to Melbourne, Australia, had sort of taken on sort of ridiculous proportions. So basically people were fined several, uh, you know, thousands of dollars just for the pleasure of just sitting in the park alone. Uh, socially uh, distanced because somehow they were sort of situated 5.1 kilometres away from their home. Uh, so you know, so you have the you have the sort of ridiculousness of um, of you know highly stringent uh, sort of police power. But then, but then again, you know, you might have in a polycentrically sort of ordered uh, emergent uh, arrangement uh, a, a, a similar form of police power in the terms of shaming. Why aren't you wearing a mask? <laughs> you know, um, you know the, the, these. The, I mean, the, the, this this could be um, uh, a, a you know a hypothetical situation as well. But then, um, I'm all <laughs> then to add to add to the compl uh, the complexification of such matters. Uh, I am aware that you know people may have certain medical conditions which you know prohibit them actually so having cloth, you know, or yeah. um, you know certain fibers on their sort of face, you know, lest it sort of provides irritation. So. Uh, it's not not a not a simple story, um, but I agree with the general uh, sentiment that um, you know, there are sort of complicated sort of nuances and distinctions between uh, the effects of uh, a lockdown, which I think can be quite serious, uh, especially on uh, sort of an economic uh, economic basis, as as we've seen, right? As we've seen, we've had lived experience of of this versus uh, some other sort of, uh, uh, sort of, sets of sets of measures which come to the same effect. All right. Oh, okay, uh, Cameron, you have a follow-up and then we'll, we'll go to Erwin. Who also yeah, sorry, real quick. Um, yeah. So I, I had posted a, the follow-up question in the chat. I guess what I was getting at is less about the equivalence between the two ordering processes and more about given the effects that we see how do we know which ordering process is responsible? Like mm -hmm. if we say something like lockdowns are bad because small businesses are getting obliterated. It's not clear to me that small businesses getting obliterated is directly due to the lockdowns as opposed to no, voluntary no. decisions. No, exactly. And as I indicated in, in, in my talk, uh, uh, the um, uh, economic con contraction may be attributable to people making their own decisions to physically uh, distance and stay at home. Uh, and that's not to say that uh, the wonders of digital technology cannot uh, be used to, uh, to enable uh, orders of certain tangible goods. Um, that's, that, that's also clearly the effect. Uh, in an entangled political economy, I dare say uh, that it actually might be extremely difficult to actually trace out um, the, uh, so the effects of uh, different isolated processes, unless they're you know, very um, obviously clear. I mean, I, I can only sort of imagine, you know, a hypothetical example, which probably exists nowhere in the world where, um, you know, essentially, uh, you know, the, the government has arranged a, a number of restrictive uh, measures, but has left silent the issue of, um, you know, people in nursing homes. So for example, you know, aged care homes. So there may be a sort of hypothetical example where uh, the commercial enterprises and not-for-profit enterprises which own and manage these uh, nursing homes may make their own <laughs> executive unilateral decisions as it were uh, to, to lock down. So in the hypothetical, very, you know, sort of clear, sort of well, clearly imagined examples like that, it might be possible to sort of trace the sort of the effects of suppress, suppression of spread. Um, but, you know, the, I, I'm referring to an almost fantastical example, of course, and, and so in an entangled political economy, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult um, uh, to, to think about uh, uh, directly sort of isolating given effects. And we also have to sort of think as well, uh, my own suspicion, I'd, I'd I don't know if I have a, a credible scientific basis for saying this, but I, 
uh, it seems to me that seasonality, so you know, there's broader factors like seasonality, which have an effect uh, in terms of uh, coronavirus incidents. So, uh, you know, in, in North America, if you're there, you are there. Um, um, it's essentially, um, you know, you you know, sort of having the having colder months and you know, and and, and, and tragically a sort of a spike in cases. Whereas now here in the southern hemisphere, in summer we've had like a small pocket case in uh, South Australia, the, the state of South Australia. But you know, the things are seem to be quietening down. Um, so it's again, it just sort of adds to the the difficulties of being able to sort of ice, to be able to undertake that kind of isolationist kind of um, kind of uh, research and study. Okay, uh, excellent discussion, uh, Erwin. Yeah, thanks, Michaela. Um, I want to first sort of um, compliment you for, for one point or perhaps confirm it, and that's the point on um, the healthcare industry. So I think it was very visible um, at least here in Western Europe, that since medicine was already part of or publicly provided, that it also, and then there was, of course, a spike in, 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 in cases and hospitalizations. And so the expansion had to happen. It failed to happen. The, the expansion of capacity had to happen. It failed to happen for all sorts of, um, yeah, the, the sense that it was basically sluggish. And then uh, the rest of the economy had yeah, had to lock down in order to alleviate this one industry, right? So here you have a government that's that's in charge of, of one industry, basically, um, yeah, spreading the costs of, yeah, well, okay. So I, I thought that dynamic, you described that very well. And it, and so, so I like that very much. But there was another dynamic, and that this perhaps is more closely related to what Cameron is, is, is hinting at, and that is that at least, but this might be a local experience, right? But we can learn perhaps from the other countries is that the government in the Netherlands didn't want to lock down schools. Then the parents got upset and the teachers got upset. <clears throat> and then we locked down schools as, as well. They became included in a lockdown for a certain period of time. Of course, this is a more, yeah, I think a more difficult issue. And <clears throat> yeah, I think in the long run, it, I came to realize that part of what we don't know as citizens in modern society is to live with risk. So we've eliminated risk nearly everywhere. Um, and so we have a hard time dealing with, well, perhaps even tragedy in, 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 in life, but so the, these, these elements, and so we've eliminated them, them everywhere. And so when they reappear, we, yeah, right, we panic. And yeah, we panic in the face of uncertainty. And so we start to demand for things that provide a sense of certainty, even though they might in hindsight or right, on a sort of rational choice basis not be very effective. Um, but I, I, I wonder whether there's some way of, of taking this, this dynamic into account, because yeah, at, at least from my perspective, it, it, it was a very significant effect. So there was the significant effect that you, you highlighted that started from the public sector, but this also seemed to be a very significant effect in the sense that we failed yeah some people say be courageous your grandma always tells you to be courageous but like um we, we lost that that sense a little bit right we send our children away saying be careful when they went to school and now school wasn't wasn't safe anymore so we keep them home um yeah i i think uh, your 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 comments uh, thank you for the the they're excellent and they're sort of uh broken into three parts uh, so uh, the, the, I'll address the third part uh, uh, now, uh, which is essentially um, a sort of a sociological or so socio-psychological uh, sort of ramifications of crisis. I think this is uh, very important. I'm, I'm aware, certainly, um, you know, a number of sociologists are starting to sort of think about uh, the, uh, the implications of a a so-called era of unrolling crises, whether it be, you know, climate change, you know, going into well in the localised sense in Australian bushfires and then, you know, coronavirus, the GFC on top of that, uh, uh, and, and, and people's, uh, people's ability sort of to accommodate sort of structural change. Uh, I think um, this is something I don't uh, cover in, in my paper because I kind of tend to see the 
scope of the paper to be a little bit more containerized. But I think what you mentioned is a seriously important uh, matter. Uh, there, there may be a scope to uh, create a sort of a micro level explanation of um, perhaps Robert Higgs's uh, depiction of crisis uh, and, you know, how that sort of induces uh, sort of governmental responses. So a micro uh, level uh, explanation would attend uh, to uh, the, the sort of the, the, the tectonic effects of perceived crises upon, um, you know, one, one sort of understanding or familiarity of place in the world. Um, and also sort of disruptive, disrupted notions of what the future might entail as well. So um, th this, is, this is something I'd, I'd like to be able to address sometime uh, in, into the future, but I'm, I'm quite aware that, you know, people are starting to turn their minds to those very important questions. Um, the education example is fascinating. Um, something else that I hadn't covered uh, in my own paper, uh, but is a natural complement to understanding the peculiar uh, enterprise of healthcare uh, in this sort of pandemic period. Uh, education, it seems to be a, be a, a, a more complicated and nuanced uh, sort of uh, feature of uh, public sort of discourse and contestation. Um, and it also brings in sort of broader uh, social dimensions such as you know, gender imbalances with respect to uh, home production responsibilities and like. So um, I, I think this, um, uh, uh, you know, thinking about the peculiar business of education during a pandemic uh, period would be a very fruitful line of research. And if I can attend very briefly to your first uh, sort of point about uh, health, um, again, something I'd, 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 I'm tempted to sort of try to want to try to introduce into the working paper, but I fear that space limitations might preclude me from doing so, uh, is to sort of really um, be quite, to present a, a very critical posture uh, with respect to the, the management of, um, of uh, health, by health political enterprises in response to this. Uh, there, there seems no doubt to me that uh, these uh, political, quasi-political enterprises, these peculiar businesses were very much uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 sort of exposed um, in response to the pandemic, and curiously, that exposure had happened in light of you know governmental reports in a number of countries over the past decade warning of uh, sort of pandemic as a potential existential risk, uh, you know, to uh, sort of to be aware of, uh, you know. Um, very, very much so in, in, a, in Australia and in Western Europe with highly socialized uh, healthcare systems. It's, it's quite interesting and quite telling to see uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the exposure of these enterprises to, you know, simple issue of not having uh, sufficient uh, PPE uh, equipment. Uh, and it brings to me, uh, to my mind, the critiques of the healthcare system that Milton Friedman uh, covered in, an, in Free to Choose and perhaps even in Capitalism and uh, Freedom with respect to the amount of resources diverted to administrative uh, functions. So I think uh, he refers to a little known or, um, writer named Max Gammon, who uh, you know, e explicates a law of uh, sort of increased bureaucratic spending within the healthcare system uh, to the extent that uh, internalized resources are diverted towards administrative functions rather than basic, you know, public health supplies, then um, there probably is something of an indictment of uh, how health systems have, uh, have responded. And as you've said, um, you know, the, the, the response or the lack thereof initially has uh, led to, uh, had contributed, had been associated with uh, very severe costs upon the economy as a whole in terms of lockdown policy. Excellent. Uh, okay, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I will take this as an uh, opportunity to to jump in and um, sort of building on on uh, Erwin's uh, question of the risk. Uh, I want to ask, um, why is it that as a society or most members of society fail to understand that the top-down solutions come with risk, that they are not bulletproof, that they 
fail, right? Like, of course, uh, we know that lockdowns are not necessarily uh, successful. So, uh, so, so why is it, right? Is it just like centralized mindset that we have a tendency to uh, perceive uh, top-down solutions as, as better? Or is it lack of um, learning, right? Like almost th the top-down solutions usually are anti-learning, right? There is no alternative path that generates um, an alternative sort of counterfactual uh, reality, right? So, so what is that? I, I um, like why why is it that we have this tendency to to just uh, turn? And by we, of course, I, I mean the broad society, right? The the the, the social demands for for top down uh, solutions, even though they of course come come with risk and are not that uh, successful. Yeah, I feel I feel that the question you're asking, Marta, will be something that will animate social scientists for many decades to to continue. Um, I, I think there are just a whole, whole array of um, uh, largely, you know, perhaps, you know, sort of cultural and sociological and psychological uh, uh, issues sort of related here. And um, your question reminds me of uh, the 1956 version uh, preface to The Road to Serfdom in which uh, sort of Friedrich Hayek sort of refers to the uh, the, the quintessential underlying point of his particular project being an examination of the psychological effect of policy um, upon, you know, a, a populace and how this breeds a familiarity, if not an expectation, uh, for certain forms of action to take place. And of course, you know, pol politicians in a sort of vibrant and evolving uh, entangled political economy um, are just as you know, and you know, just as creative uh, and enterprising as uh, people in their sort of non-state private capacities, in the sense that they they too wish to seek um, profitable opportunities, even if in the uh, peculiar sort of environment of um, the sort of the the, the parliament, uh, the, bu the bureaucracies, and uh, court systems, and so um, people in, who are versed with behavioural economics uh, might be familiar with a, a notion of action, of action bias, um, you know, in which uh, governments uh, governments feel impelled um, uh, either by actual practical demands or just imaginings uh, that they ought to sort of take some action, action something quickly, uh, especially in terms of uh, a tangible. Uh, crisis such as a, a pandemic, um, you know, one can sort of understand, uh, I guess, to to some extent, uh, the the feverish uh, feverish uh, responses to a pandemic relative to, let's say, a, a crisis that uh, is certainly unfolding but takes on a sort of more abstract ma macro uh, dimension such as climate change. So, you know, in the case of pandemic, you know, I mean people are getting, feeling very ill and people are dying. Um, and so, uh, and, 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 in, and in addition to, in addition to that, you know, governments have somehow um, over, uh, as a, owing to quite complex historical and political processes have assumed onto themselves, uh, primarily the responsibility for managing public health. And obviously there are exposed economic rationales for that, you know, if you're thinking through the history of economic thought, such as externality effects, which um, you know provide ex post rationales um, for what uh, sort of governments are doing. So um, I'm, I'm not giving a sort of clear and easy answer because I don't believe there actually is one. Um, but uh, the the answer must surely to your question uh, be wrapped up in a whole range of uh, sort of cultural, social, psychological, political, and other dimensions intertwined, if dare I say, entangled. Um, let's see, can, can you hear me? Of course, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I got lost track of when I'm muted and when I'm not. Um, okay. I, I wonder if it isn't, you know, Hayek's atavism of social justice, sort of. Um, you know, in a cartoon version, it's definitely a cartoon version, in a cartoon version of human uh, history, you know, there was like we were caveman, and then there was the invention of agriculture, and all of a sudden we're dealing with strangers. So right up until 10,000 years ago, it was band level society, it was everything. 
Now, it, it is more complicated than that and everything, but the evolutionary history of when like society is the small band mm -hmm. and it's us is longer than the evolutionary history of like, trade with strangers. Even though, by the way, I think that it's not clear how far back that trade with strangers go, could even be half a million years, but that's still less than the millions of years of you know, hominy evolution, uh, if I'm using the right word there. Um, so I, anyway, I, so I just think that that's got to be a big piece of it. And when something becomes a political decision, we get into that we thinking, you know, yeah. that uh, in which we, you know, petition our leader to make, you know, the right choice that we will all then adhere to. That's kind of goes deep in our evolutionary psychology. Or so I, I think. I think there's, yeah, I think there's something to that. And I think, um, and this may be subject to exploration by somebody one, one hopes um, of um, uh, Hayek's statement in um, uh, The Fatal Conceit referring to the tension and conflict between uh, interfacing, living and existing and managing the so-called micro and macro cosmos, right? Uh, what's really interesting, and I'm just, I'm just, um, uh, I think the the, um, the significance of the point is kind of just bearing on me now, so bear with me. But I think um, one of the things that's very very traceable and very evident during this pandemic has been the the reported the publicly result, reported desires of uh, people in sort of everyday life uh, to kind of draw in their horns a little bit in response to uh, the the pandemic and to basically return to the hearth of home and and family. Um, and you and and you see uh, you see you know um, a lot of that practice. You see a lot of internal migration within countries as people attempt to return home. Uh, so you know, look after elderly uh, parents. I believe that Deirdre McCloskey has has done that, for example, among many 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 um, other people. And and to be sure, the uh, the the closure of borders, uh, including my home country has introduced great anxiety and stress as people um, you know, find themselves psychologically torn between that instinct to return uh, to family, to draw in the horns, to, um, you know, to some, somehow retreat from the great society, right, of um, impersonal exchange to some extent, uh, back, back to family. And you, then you see these interesting sort of um, efforts in home production, you know, people engaging in baking contests and things like that when ordinarily, well, you know, um, I guess in the modern period, people would just ordinarily outsource a lot of those things to the market anyway. So, um, yeah, so I think there's something really intriguing and interesting in your suggestion, Roger. Thank you. All right. So, oh, I see I have something in the chat. Uh, Okay, so Ervin has another question. I will get to you in a second, but I want to um, share with you a thought that I just uh, came to me after Ro uh, Roger's comment. So I guess uh, based on what you said, the ideal sort of leader, right? Like if we uh, were lucky enough to actually have a benevolent dictator, um, that would be someone who produces um, credence goods that actually, that actually do nothing, right? So like there's a symbol, um, there's the appearance of doing something, but there is no actual change to social relations. If that's the case, then the Biden's uh, mandate might be the best thing we can hope for, right? Like you will get the credence good, you get the appearance of something being done, but in reality, um, we're kind of left to, to deal with the pandemic on our own anyway. Anyway. Yeah, um, yeah no, the, the, an interesting comment and, I, and, and I've been, and again, this is a very complicated um, matter. I have been wondering just how much um, you know, your 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 country has rude, perhaps um, uh, sort of missed opportunities to try to sort of deal with this pandemic. But then it raises a question as to how do you how would you have dealt with it uh, in a sort of constructive manner, let's say in the first half of 2020. Uh, <laughs> It's, a, it's an open question, but I'm, I'm sure there are no sort of, um, you know, sort of no, no sort of clear um, an answers, answers to that. Okay, Ervin. Yeah, no, so I, I, I was um, 
struck by that we didn't really talk that much about knowledge. So let me speak up for the government. What the government did here was act as a coordinator. So it um, created a, a kind of focal response that other people could adopt. If you really look at how it was enforced, it, it sounds like Melbourne was a lot different than here, um, but it in fact set a set of rules that in the Netherlands at, even are admitted to be not legal. They have no legal binding force mm -hmm. often. They are here not enforced by policemen, but by so-called special officers that have no real authority. Um, um, and, and so, I mean, I, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a bit of devil's advocate, but there is of course a very serious knowledge problem in a, in a, in a, in a very uncertain situation. Mm -hmm. And so to maintain some kind of coordination, it is important that somebody takes the lead in pro providing a, a, a set of information and practices that people can coordinate around. Uh, mask wearing is certainly the most obvious one of those. Um, social distancing, right? The six feet or eight feet, what, whatever it is. It's 1.5 meters over here. Um, it's is another one of those, which right in the is 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 very hard to think of as an enforceable rule, and, and people are in constant violation. So it's really more of a, a sort of focal point that also in the classroom I'm currently trying to maintain as a sort of social norm, much more than anything else. So is there anything to that story or would we think very differently from your perspective about this knowledge coordinating function? Um, I, I, it's, it's a, I, I think there's validity to what, what you say, to be honest. And, and to be sure, um, it, it, would, it would certainly seem that uh, the, the reflex of much of my paper is sort of, a, uh, sort of an anti-response in terms of uh, governmental interactivity. I'm kind of referring to the sort of the dark side of uh, interactivity. Whereas, um, you know, I mean, it, it is also true that um, uh, sort of, you know, governmental action can have a, a warranted place in a liberal society. That's my, my own view, as long as, um, you know, the sort of entails sort of, uh, you know, sort of low sort of informational sort of requirements. So there's no cognitive overbearing upon uh, policymakers in terms of the determination of uh, policy and, you know, also respecting of generality rules uh, as much as, as possible. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm also alive to the fact, and I, I kind of uh, feel sometimes I seem to be the only person in my sort of circle of associates who seem alive to this fact that uh, sort of authors such as uh, Tony Yu, and there was actually an interesting entry in um, the Encyclopedia of Public Choice uh, edited by uh, Rowley and Schneider. There's a small chapter about, you know, in this, which circumstances do actually government succeed. Uh, policymakers do have a capacity to learn. Uh, they, they do have a capacity to, uh, to make inter-jurisdictional benchmark comparisons. Um, uh, this, this seems clear to me. Also, uh, Ligica Botka and Taka's book, and I'm just looking at it now, about public governance and classical liberalism, you know, also refers uh, to the, the idea that uh, just because one can be critical of certain postures of governmental action, that one should not throw the baby out the bathwater. I, I, I wouldn't certainly want, I don't want to sort of uh, provide that kind of impression uh, not at all. Um, and at the, toward the end of my talk, I do talk about uh, you, the, the legitimacy of, you know, some governmental response. I think the informational, um, informational dissemination is always, um, it seems to me to be a sort of quite helpful potential sort of public policy response. Uh, but even within that, uh, we, we had seen a couple of missteps there with respect to masking. Is masking good or bad? I think the the emerging scientific consensus and we allow the scientific process to take place uh, suggests that mark masking is quite efficacious. It seems, seems quite sensible and commonsensical that it would be, but, um, but scientific evidence increasingly now supports that view. Whereas, you know, there were, you know, some, some questioning, perhaps even some contrarian posture very early on. Um, but I think the, the, the point you raise is, is significantly important because uh, there has to be some role, I do think, uh, 
uh, in terms of governmental involvement. It, it, the question is, what is, uh, what should that be? And that should be, and I'm speaking just at a broad high level principle, those which uh, respect generality principles as, as much as possible in terms of, let's say, universal uh, information provision or universal service provision of uh, some sort. And, and policies which, you know, following Andreas Berg and his discussion of the welfare state does not entail um, regulatory and other postures which entail too much uh, cognitive overtaxing. Uh, the, the Melbourne example of, you know, sort of extraordinary police power seems to be um, the, the opposite of that, that, that principle. You know, just reams and reams of regulation as to what you must do, number of seats and, you know, which, which establishment, you know, you know, um, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, can't be 5.1 kilometres away from your residence, for example. <laughs> so you have to use a tape measure. <laughs> so. Excellent. Thank you, Michaela. It is a great meeting when the host forgets to keep track of time. So uh, thank you for for an uh, engaging uh, discussion, excellent presentation. Uh, we need to stop here. Yes, Michaela, congrats. And uh, I will see you all uh, in a month for Cameron's uh, presentation. Cameron already shared the paper with me, so I will send it out probably to tomorrow or depend, really depends on the kids, right? So when I get to my laptop next, I need to go now because they're all crying and my husband is going crazy. So oh, thank anyway. You for the <laughs> questions too, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Michaela. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for organizing, Marta. Pleasure. Pleasure as always. See you. Bye.